So this is part two of bone homeostasis. We discussed previously the amount of calcium and phosphorus consumed. Now let's see how they get absorbed and where. So food gets eaten and goes towards the stomach and through the intestine and out as poo. The intestines are made up of the large and small. We will be looking at the small intestine. Calcium and phosphorus are predominantly absorbed in the small intestine. Now these are small intestines which I'm drawing. And these small intestines, they head towards the large intestines and then finally out as poo. Again, calcium and phosphorus are predominantly absorbed in the small intestines. What absorbs these calcium and phosphorus molecules within the intestines are special cells called mucosal cells, which are type of epithelial cell, epithelium cell. We have learned that about, from the previous uh, part one, we have learned that about 850 milligrams per 100 mil of calcium is excreted as feces daily. Calcium is absorbed by the small intestines via, via two processes, the active and the passive transport. The active transport is when the calcium is absorbed against its concentration gradient. This means that calcium requires energy to be absorbed. For example, a calcium molecule within the lumen if it wants to get absorbed and move into the body, it requires energy, ATP. The next one is passive transport, which is basically a diffusion process. This means that if there's a more concent concentration of calcium within the lumen, and there's only a little bit on the other side, calcium can easily um, ha ev evens out. Um, Daily, about 300 milligrams per 100 mil of phosphorus is excreted as feces, and phosphorus is absorbed predominantly by the active transport. Again, what this means is that if phosphorus wants to get absorbed into the body, it requires energy. Another regulation site besides the intestines and the kidneys, um, and besides the intestines are the kidneys which calcium and phosphorus are, are absorbed or secreted as urine. Kidneys are the main regulation site for phosphorus and mainly work by the active transport. The functional unit of the kidneys and where calcium and phosphorus are absorbed are the nephrons. Here we have the head of the nephron which continues to the proximal convoluted tubules followed by the loop of Henle through the distal convoluted tubules and out through the collecting ducts. The final product is total urine. So for phosphorus, about 85% of the phosphorus absorbed within the kidneys are absorbed in the proximal convoluted tubules, and the remainder, 15%, is excreted out as total urine. Now this 15% is a total amount of phosphorus secreted daily by the kidneys, which if you remember from part 1 is 1,100 milligrams per 100 mil. For calcium, on the other hand, the most uh, mostly calcium is a, um, a filtrable calcium is absorbed within the kidneys, and by order where it's mostly absorbed within the nephron, um, so it's mostly absorbed within the proximal and then the loop of Henle and then the distal, um, and only one percent of the total calcium which is regulated in the kidneys is secreted as total urine calcium concentration, which is. 150 milligrams per 100 mil of daily calcium. Now from this we can say that there is less calcium um, which is regulated within the, within the nephrons, within the kidneys, and that's why um, kidneys, um, in the kidneys phosphorus is the main regulation site. So the regulation site for calcium and phosphorus as we have discussed are the kidneys and the small intestines. But one of the main regulation sites is actually the bone. Um, there's also the cells, just normal body cells, but we won't really talk about that. So let's go over what we learned in part one really quickly. Um, if you remember, bone is made up of collagen and other minerals, particularly calcium phosphate. So here we draw calcium phosphate. Um, so the mineral portion of the bone is mostly calcium phosphate in the form known as hydroxyapatite crystals. So calcium phosphate within the bone 
there's it's mainly it's mainly found in a group called hydroxyapatite crystals. And now a corny or random way of remembering this word um, is you can imagine a wave, and we'll call this wave hydro, which means just water, hydro. So hydro has an appetite for crystals, hydroxyapatite crystals. Yep, very cool. So the bone cells as shown, oh, so bone have many cells that help regulate calcium and phosphorus concentrations, and therefore bone homeostasis. We will look in these cells, we'll talk about these cells now. So the bone cells, as discussed in part one, if you remember, there are three uh, main bone cells that we discussed, and they were, they all begin with osteo, osteocytes, osteoblasts, and osteoclasts. Uh, Osteocytes look like diamond uh, cells and they are connected with each other. And they are a complex channel, uh, they have complex connection channels, and these connection channels are known as canaliculi. Osteoblasts are the bone building cells and they secrete a collagen like substance which initiates new bone formation. Now, if osteoblasts are inactive, or are trapped in their own collagen matrix, they can become osteocytes. Um, the last cell we are going to discuss are the osteoclasts, which are giant multinucleated, um, around average six nucleus, and they secrete acid, uh, which destroys the bone matrix. There are also other types of bone cells, but they're not so important in this uh, matter, in this section. So let us look at these cells in a bit more detail. So here I'll draw a bone, a really bad bone, and the osteocytes are situated on the outer part of the bone. And in the center, if you remember, there are these holes. And this section is called or known as a spongy bone. And the outer section of the bone is known as compact bone, where the osteocytes are residing. Now, also on the outer part of the compact bone, uh, we can find osteoblasts. And if you remember, osteoblasts, if they're inactive, they can, they can become osteocytes. Osteoblasts also secrete three important substances, OPG, MCSF, and attach to themselves rank ligand. A uh, rank ligand can also be a free molecule, molecule, but it's usually bound to the osteoblast uh, surface. Now all these mo molecules, they affect osteoclast in a certain way. Now let us look at these functions of these molecules in more detail. So first we'll begin with rank ligand. Now rank ligand uh, stands for receptor activator nuclear factor kappa ligand. Um, so here we have an osteoblast with the rank ligand and here we have a normal osteoclast. And so if rank ligand binds to the rank receptor on osteoclast, it increases osteoclastic activity. So basically rank ligand increases osteoclastic activity meaning less bone and more minerals being absorbed by the bone. Next we have MCSF, which stands for Multiple Colony Stimulating Factor. Basically, MCSF is here, and the osteoclasts, they have a special receptor for MCSF called CFMS receptor. When MCSF binds to the osteoclast, CFMS receptor, it activates more osteoclasts. Therefore, we can say that MCSF increases proliferation and survival of osteoclasts. So the first two molecules, rank ligand and MCSF, promote osteoclastic activity, basically. And this last one, it doesn't. This last one is OPG. And OPG stands for osteoprotenogen. And so we learned that normally osteoblasts have rank ligands which are, which are for osteoclasts, increasing osteoclastic activity. Now oh, what OPG does is OPG prevents rank ligand from binding to rank receptors on osteoclasts. Therefore, OPG acts as a decoy receptor. No rank binding um, to osteoclasts means no increase in osteoclastic activity. So this concludes section two. Section three, part three, will look into the hormones, vitamin D, um, calcitonin and parathyroid hormone and how it regulates bone homeostasis. Thank you.